ready. Okay. So hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's SEDS Online webinar. Um, we want to thank, of course, the IES for sponsoring SEDS Online and um, helping us make all of the material on the website available free of charge to all of you. Make sure and check it out. Um, we have virtual field trips. We have all of the webinars um, recorded and now uploaded onto the website. So check back one or two days after each Wednesday and we should have that ready to go. So make sure and um, yeah, utilize all of those, those things that we have for you. So today's lecture is by Dr. Sam Perkis. Sam is the Department Chair of Marine Geosciences at the Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Miami. Sam received his bachelor's from the University of Southampton in marine biology after becoming a dive instructor for a couple of years. He then moved on to the Netherlands where he received both his master's and his PhD from the Purdue University. Since then, Sam went over to Florida um, to work at Nova Southeastern University before coming to the University of Miami in 2016. Sam's research focuses on better understanding the spatial self-organization, primarily in um, carbonate environments. So today he's going to talk to us about one of my personal favorite places to um, do research and teach, the Bahamas. And so, Sam, we will um, give the mic to you, and I look forward to a great presentation. All right then. Well, Chelsea, thank you very much, uh, and also to Stephen for putting this together, and of course, a lot of gratitude to, for the uh, IAS for hosting this great uh, seminar series. The title of the presentation will be Always a White Christmas in the Bahamas. It's got a, a seasonal feel to it, and I'll be talking about ocean chemistry and hydrodynamics and how they focus winter mud production on Great Bahama Bank. And before I start, let me just acknowledge my collaborators and co-authors. So I'm working in Miami with Amanda Aylert and Heather Hunter, Peter Swart and Mitch Harris. And also with a group out of the University de Catholique in de Leuven in Belgium, who we've been collaborating with on the hydrodynamic modeling we've been doing in the Bahamas. And that's Thomas Dumbledore and Emmanuel Hannett. And in the presentation, I'm going to be talking about whitings. And we see here in this lovely aerial photograph flying over, uh, this is Little Bahama Bank. I took the photo of, um, a few weeks ago. And you can see the discoloration of the bank top waters. And we call these events whitings because of the color that the water is turned. And what is happening here is we're seeing the spontaneous precipitation of aragonite uh, from the uh, platform top waters. And they are something which is now in the modern earth, at least, quite peculiar to the Bahamas. And we also get whitings in the Persian Arabian Gulf. And I'll be talking about what forms them and why they're so important. So there's an aerial photograph of the Bahamas. And if we now pop up into orbit, so this is a satellite image acquired with uh, MODIS. So MODIS is actually uh, two satellites. There's MODIS Terra, which overpasses every point on Earth at 10.30 in the morning local time, and Aqua at 1.30 in the afternoon. It has 36 spectral bands, and I'm showing here an image of Great Bahama Bank. So this is uh, just to get situated at the beginning of the talk, because we'll be staying in the same place. This is Florida, just poking in the top left. This is Cuba down below. Then we have Key Sal Bank here, Great Bahama Bank and Little Bahama Bank, and of course, Andros Island. So we're just, we're just zooming in here on the blue box. And we can see in the MODIS imagery, this discoloration of the water column, and I zoom in, in it even further, and we can see the whitings uh, from orbit. And it's uh, this ability to count them over long time periods and, long uh, and wide spatial scales that I'll be talking about to build uh, my case on why we care about whitings. And the reason why we care is twofold. And the first of that takes us into uh, deep time. And this is, uh, this is a, a graph here from Robert Riding. And we see that when we go uh, down uh, through time past uh, the first skeletal organisms that form carbonate, if we look at Claudinia or so, which appears about 600 million years, and continue back to a billion a uh, billion and a half years or so, we have a lot of carbonate which is deposited on Earth, 
Uh, of course, it's not skeletal in nature because the organisms haven't yet evolved. And likely a lot of that carbonate was precipitated directly from the water column itself. And it might be that if we can understand those processes in the modern environment, we can have a better understand, uh, understanding of what was happening in deep time. So that's the first reason, at least, why I care about whitings. And the second reason is that they have an immense ability to produce uh, lime mud, to produce aragonitic mud. Uh, and we, the Bahamas is a great example of that. So Lisa Robbins, for example, she calculated that annually on Great Bahama Bank, you get somewhere north of about 1.3 million tons of mud produced by whitings and uh, Turpin et al. She showed that the, uh, that mud uh, has been produced in this way, at least back to the Miocene. So it has a, a strong temporal component. And we have to remember that carbonate sediments represent arguably the most important archives of Earth's climate and the evolution of the biosphere. And so we really need to understand how all carbonates are forming, skeletal and non-skeletal, like the whitenings, if we're going to understand the geochemical signatures that they are actually capturing in a rock record. So the presentation will give a number of findings. And I'll just give a, a, a preview of those. And the first is that uh, whitings seem to be initiating within mixing fronts atop Great Bahama Bank when you have temperature gradients exceeding about a degree Celsius. And once you initiate a whiting, it has an area uh, on average of around 13 square kilometers. It persists for more than nine days. It drifts 20 kilometers and produces in excess of 5,500 metric tons of lime mud per whiting. And I'll be explaining actually, that's probably an underestimate. There's a seasonal frequency to this phenomenon. The whitings are much more frequent in the winter than the summer, and that's a conundrum. And there also seems, seems to be some multi-decadal cyclicity, which I will uh, put in to uh, the large-scale um, climatology uh, of the Florida region. Yeah, it seems that you can double the amount of whitings being produced uh, on Great Bahama Bank, so that would be doubling the amount of mud produced by rising sea level by just a few centimeters and warming the off-platform currents by a degree or so. So it seems that the, the whitings are very sensitive to subtle environmental forcings. And we're going to produce a, a, a sediment budget model, which shows that whitings can account for at least 60% of all the Holocene bank top and peri-platform mud that we see on uh, Great Bahama Bank. But more likely, it's at least 100% of those deposits. And I'll say that appropriately sized subtropical platforms are predisposed to copious mud production through whitings. And by analogy, this might be very significant on ancient platforms also. So this is not entirely new work uh, that I'm presenting. I, I've uh, published on it before. And I'll just give a recap of, of what we understand so far about these processes. And our looking at whitings, counting them in the beginning manually from satellites, and I'll take you up to the top right hand corner here, shows that if you look on an annual basis, the whitings are about 70% more prevalent in the winter months, so that's January through April, and then November and December, as they are through the summer months. And we've begun to understand that the likely reason for that uh, propensity to form the mud in the winter has to do with the temperature of the water, or not exactly the temperature, but the difference in temperature between waters which are mixing uh, on the Great Bahama Bank. And I show here on the left hand side uh, bi monthly plots of sea surface temperature monitored from satellites. So the top one is January, February, March, April, and all the way through November, December. And the colors here are the temperature of the water. So the cool colors are cool water and the hot colors are warmer water. And first, what you can see in the summer is that uh, the off-platform water, so this would be the Florida current, which is sweeping up the western margin of Great Bahama Bank is, is quite warm. And the platform top waters are also nice and toasty. And anyone who's gone swimming in the Bahamas would recognize that. If you go in the winter, like today, where I can tell you it's very cold in the region, it would look something more like in the bottom right, where the platform top waters get really cold in the winter because they're shallow and they're chilled by the northerly winter winds. 
but the Florida current uh, off here to the west remains nice and warm. So we get a temperature disparity of four or five degrees. And we think this disparity has something to say about uh, promoting the precipitation of the aragonitic mud. This temperature idea is really just an old hypothesis that I'm revisiting called the inimical water hypothesis, which uh, Bob Ginsberg and Wolfgang Schlager had worked on in the past, also Newman and McIntyre. And they had pinned these very cold waters that we get forming in the Bahamas as one reason why you don't get luxurious reef growth on the margins of the um, of the Bohemian platforms, because this water is so cold, it's lower than the thermal tolerance of the corals. And I can tell you uh, from today's temperature how you could understand that. So why now would mixing waters of disparate temperatures uh, have something to say about pre precipitating aragonitic mud? Well, this is work uh, I will uh, present from Amanda Aylert, a co colleague of mine in the Department of Marine Geosciences at Rasmus. And we've been working together to look at the effect of mixing waters of different temperatures, uh, what it has on the aragonite saturation state of those waters. And this is a flash diagram here, which shows the aragonite saturation state on the y-axis and the proportional mixing of on-platform waters and off-platform waters uh, on the x-axis. So first, if we go to the summer months and we take the temperature of the water, uh, as audited from satellite in, in uh, bi-monthly periods, July and August, September and October and May and June. And we mix the on and off platform waters and see what effect that has on the aragonite saturation state. The lines in the flash diagram are nearly horizontal and mixing those waters really does not do a great deal to, their, to the aragonite saturation state of the waters. Note, however, the saturation state is higher in the summer than it is in the winter. If now we mix uh, the on and off platform waters in the, in the um, winter in this model, so remember in the winter the on platform waters are rather cold and the off platform waters are rather warm, we can see that mixing the two water bodies leads to an instantaneous bump in the saturation state of those waters. And you can see that bump is represented here by the, the heavy slope to the line uh, as it passes across this mixing axis on the X uh, axis. And we think that this bump in aragonite saturation state serves as a kinetic trigger, which might start to uh, produce that enhanced number of whitings that we see in the winter months as we do in the summer. And indeed we can model that spatially and we can see how that zone of heightened aragonite saturation state is situated uh, inboard of the platform margin of Great Bahama Bank. So that's our working hypothesis. And I won't go further into the, uh, the chemical aspect of it at the moment, because Amanda is still working on that. And we have some new results, which will hopefully uh, be coming out soon. And I'm instead going to concentrate on how we can understand the mixing of waters on uh, Great Bahama Bank. So to do that, we can actually image the mixing from satellite. So this is a, uh, a satellite product uh, on the left hand side. This is Andros Island again, and this would be the western margin of Great Bahama Bank. And this would be the tongue of the ocean coming in here. And we can image the temperature of the water in two ways, using infrared uh, energy uh, when it's not cloudy. And if we have clouds over the platform, we can then switch to using microwaves. And between the two, we can build up daily temperature maps regardless of what the clouds are doing. And so this is a very powerful way of looking at the on-platform, well, and off-platform water temperatures. And we can process those temperature maps to accentuate the mixing gradients. And that's what I show over here on the right-hand side. So in this case, the more red the image is, the more accentuated the mixing gradient. And you can see on this day, which was uh, in 2017 in February, how we develop inboard of the platform margin, a very strong mixing zone, likely related to the mixing of the on and on platform waters by tidal currents on this day. But also if you come in towards Andros Island on the platform top, you also get fairly pronounced uh, zones where water bodies with different temperatures 
are mixing, likely due to the differential heating of the water body because of the fibrillatory differences, or maybe overturning of the water body due to Langmuir cells, and so on and so forth, as Heidi Dearson has actually proposed in her paper in 2009. And the question was then, how can we relate uh, these, uh, these gradients of water mixing to the initiation of the whitings? Well, to do that, you need a long and complete record of whitings. And I've got to say that digitizing them manually from the satellite imagery becomes very laborious and tedious. I happened then walking around at Rasmus to meet Heather Hunter who is a PhD student at Rasmus, and I got chatting to Heather, and she's an expert in neural networks. Oh, I said, have I got a project for you, Heather? So I worked with her, and she, um, she developed a convolutional neural network called a CNN, which automated the counting of the whiting. So we didn't have to do it manually anymore, and we could process a whole climatology of, of daily satellite images from 2003 through 2018 and count uh, 50,000 whitings now in this database uh, to know where they were and where they're going at any point in time. So the neural network used our manual digitizations as training data, and then we end up with this new and amazing data set, which you know, Heather really should be credited with. And it's amazing what you can do uh, with neural networks. So on in B here, I show our manually counted whitings, and we managed to count 15,000 of them before we got, uh, you know, severe, severe repetitive strain injury. And then Heather came along, and now we have 50, nearly uh, 53,000 uh, whitings, and the heat map here shows their uh, spatial variability. So the hotter the color in the map, the more frequent the whitings appear in that area. And there's two sort of um, parts of the platform where the whitings are active, it turns out. There's one here to the uh, northwest of Andros Island. We call that the whiting zone. And there's a second one, which is more inboard uh, towards the island itself, uh, which is considerably smaller. Now, the incredible thing here, and I'll keep coming back to this, is that the whitings are only active in about 1% of Great Bahama Bank. They're extremely localized. But I'm going to show you, even though that that mud factory is small, it's incredibly, incredibly productive. And because it's localized, you can imagine in the rock record, if you have a similar system, that you're going to get a lot of variability on an isolated carbonate platform, uh, depending on where the mud factory is located at any point in time. And I'm going to show you that it would likely migrate through time depending on uh, oscillations of sea level and changes in chemistry and so. But just keep in mind, it's only about 1% of Great Bahama Bank where the Whiting's factory is initiated. So that's the spatial distribution of the mud factory. And then this is the temporal. So these are data from just one of the modest overpasses. This is the Terra satellite going from 2003 through 2019. And we can see several things in this long-term climatology. The first of those is that something seems to happen in 2011. Between 2003 and 2011, the number of whitings is comparatively low. And then from 2011 through 2019, it's about three times higher. And so the mud factory is really kicked into gear uh, in 2011, and we'll be exploring that in some detail in a moment. The second thing is that before 2011, you didn't have a lot of seasonality, it seems, to the mud production, but after that date, you do, and you get a summer-winter uh, signal which starts to come in with the whitings much more common in the winter than they are in the summer. So that's the long-term view. The neural network delivers a great data set, but there's a problem, of course, that unlike the sea surface temperature that we could audit through clouds, uh, when the, uh, the, the skies are cloudy, we can't see Great Bahama Bank and we can't count the whiting. So that's why there's gaps in the record. And I show that here, I've colored the cloudy days now in gray. And you can see that you only get a, a clear view of the bank every few days. Well, it turns out that if you have a long climatology that this one goes 
uh, from 2003 through 2019. Occasionally, you get lucky and you get a series of cloud-free days, seven or more days I'm taking as the, as, uh, the um, criterion for what we call a run, where you can really see the Whiting's events develop and drift and decay and understand what's going on. And we get 15 such runs uh, from the Aqua satellite and 30 or so runs from the Terra. And I'll just pick a few of these so we can really sort of dig into the anatomy of a Whiting's event over several days. And the one I'm going to pick here will be a summer event in uh, 2016, where we get more than seven days in the run. And I show six of those days here. So we start on August the 19th, and then we go through uh, till August the 22nd, down onto the bottom line here, and then we finish on the 26th. And in the back here, I'm plotting the mixing gradients that we've computed from the sea surface temperature data. And then I'm overplotting on that the whitings. And I'm using different colors to represent different states of the whiting. So those which have a green line around them were uh, appear on the day of the satellite overpass. And so we call those birthers. We're imaging that whiting on its birthday. The other whitings, which were pre-existing the day before the overpass or longer, we're going to call drifters. So they're, they're not born that day. They were born at some point earlier in time, and they're now drifting around on the platform. And I color code the drifters according to their age. So uh, whether the whiting was, was one day, uh, uh, was uh, drifting on that day, or one day prior, two days prior, or three days prior. So the number of whitings in the graphs increases through time because I'm also plotting the ones from up to three days ago so we can see how the event starts to develop. So uh, I think to show this it's easiest if we zoom in on this area here, the gray box, which I'll do here in the next slide. So what we see is that on the 8th uh, of August here, we start to develop a mixing front on the top of the platform. And you can see that here, the mixing front is the hot color in the, uh, in the SST gradient magnitude map, which I'm using as the backdrop. And along that mixing front on the 8th, we start to initiate a number of whitings. And you can see that because I've given them the green outline. So we're really seeding uh, the, the mud factory. And that continues the next day, the 21st, where that mixing front is now sort of forming two limbs. And indeed the whitings are forming along that mixing gradient. By the time we get to the 22nd, the mixing gradient is starting to decay and we're left with the whitings which were produced in previous days were actually growing in size, but now starting to drift across the platform and they continue to drift for the next four days up until the 26th of August, at which point we lose that population because we had a cloudy day and we can't, and we can't image it any further. So visually at least, it, le it seems that these mixing gradients have something to say about producing the whitings themselves and switching on the mud factory. So there's an example from the summer. Now we can dip into 2018 and a time when the platform top was a little bit cooler in April and look at another example here. And again, we see uh, on uh, April the 4th, we already have some whitings on the platform, which were, which were produced at a time that we didn't image because it was cloudy. And then we go into um, the 5th and the 6th of April and down into the 7th. And we can see that we again start to see mixing gradients between warm and cold water forming in the platform interior and they start to seed whitings which then grow in size through time very nicely shown here where these whitings are getting nourished it seems by this mixing gradient that they're associated with and then gradually that mixing gradient starts to decay again and there's a, a zoom in here uh, of that process in more detail note how the whitings seem to be associated with these strong mixing gradients. So at least uh, visually, the mixing of the, the temperatures, the waters with dif uh, differential temperatures seems to be a driver of the mud factory. So to explore that in a quantitative way, we took all of the whitings that we had in these cloud-free, uh, uh, continuous, contiguous images, and then um, attributed each one, whether it was a bertha, whether it was born on the day that the satellite overpassed, or was it a drifter, that was it was already existing when the satellite uh, came over, 
and you can see about on, on any given day on the platform top, you have about 30% of the whitings tend to be birthers and 70% uh, are drifters. Of course, there's always going to be more drifters than birthers because a birther will become a drifter after one day. The day after its birthday, it would then uh, become a uh, drifter. So uh, we could then take those birthers and drifters and extract the magnitude of the mixing gradient, which was ongoing at the time that the whiting was observed. And when we plot that for the birthers, indeed, we do see that they have a predilection to form in close proximity to the mixing gradients. That is, the birthers are found uh, when you have a one degree Celsius or greater mixing gradient, uh, are often quite a lot greater, but never less than that value. Whereas the drifters, they seem agnostic to the, to the level of mixing of the temperature of the waters, and they form across a wide variety uh, of, um, of different temperatures. So it adds quantitative evidence to the idea that the mixing of the water of different temperature is a trigger for the, for the Great Bahama Bank uh, mud factory. All right, so uh, with that, we can also look at the spatial distribution of these two categories of whitings, the birthers and the drifters. So this is our overall uh, view of all the whitings. And just to remind you that the mud factory is most active here to the northwest of Andros and a little bit inboard from Andros Island here. And then if you look just at the birthers, those which are being formed, you see that they have a rather different distribution actually. They're formed in a margin parallel zone about 15 kilometers inboard from the platform margin, where our hydrodynamic models uh, show that you get a lot of mixing of on and off platform waters driven by tidal currents. So this seems to be a zone of maximum mixing. So think of this as the Whiting's factory. This is where the mud is being produced in the water column. If you look at the drifters, uh, by contrast, they have a slightly different spatial distribution and they all um, congregate to the northwest of Andros Island. Think of that as the warehouse. This is where the mud is stored and predominantly deposited. And the reason that the Whiting's all end up in this area is to do with the hydrodynamics. And this is our collaboration with our colleagues in Belgium. And there's really two different current systems at play on the top of Great Bahama Bank. And the first is moving uh, in a northerly direction and uh, from southern Andros, and then moving up the platform margin. So any bertha whiting which is formed in this, uh, in this zone, which I show over here, is going to be gradually drifted towards the north. But it's not going to drift too far to the north and end up off the platform because it's corralled by a second current system, which is coming in from Tongue of the Ocean across the northern tip of Andros Island through the Jolters Tree, uh, Jolters Keys area. So it's those two current systems which serve to focus uh, the whitings in this area. And as I say, so you've got the factory, which is rather larger and where the mud ends up is rather smaller, the warehouse, because of the prevailing hydrodynamics. So what can you do with such a data set? Well, we started now to think about creating a sediment budget to really understand just how important the, the aragonite mud produced by Whitings is for the overall sediment budget for Great Bahama Bank, which keep in mind is the largest isolated carbonate platform uh, on the on the planet presently. So we can use the uh, sequential satellite images to get some statistics about the lifetime of a whiting, and we can track them through time. And we see that a typical whiting will drift about two kilometers in 24 hours. Well, I, that's distance made good. So that's, it, it'll move uh, um, from one satellite overpass to another about two kilometers. But of course, it's in the meantime when we can't see it, it's drifting backwards and forwards on tidal current. So it's probably, it actually covers substantially more distance. The typical duration of a whiting is nine days. It's probably even longer than that because we can only track them a certain number of time before the clouds take hold. So it's at least nine days. And that's a really important observation because we know from work by Gene Shin, for example, that if 
the mud wasn't constantly precipitating in the whiting, if for example, it was just stirred up from the seafloor, it would settle down and settle out in about six hours. So the fact that the whiting persists for many days, uh, you know, I think is very good proof that this, we're seeing the spontaneous precipitation in the water column. And of course the mud is settling, but it's been regenerated, uh, regenerated constantly and very effectively to have, you know, nine days, probably more like two weeks once the event has started, um, that can continue. Next, we can see how many whitings are active on the platform at any time. And we turn to our long-term climatology. And in the low phase of whitings production, uh, you have a, 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 a median value of around three whitings uh, active per day. And 2011 to the present time, it triples and it's more like seven or even considerably slightly higher. I mean, you can see on some days you have 30 to 50 whitings. And you have to ask yourself, what happened in 2011? Why did the Whiting's mud factory increase by a factor of three? I mean, that's really drastic. And so we've been looking at this now uh, for some time. And uh, I'm going to plot that uh, plot it here. What, what we think is the answer to that question. So this is the Whiting's frequency. It's a, a six month moving mean. This is the low phase and we go through 2011 and we go into the high phase. And we always had the intuition that temperature was important. So we started our investigation about what happened in 2011 and started to look at the temperature. So first, if you look at the on-platform waters, they're hot in the summer, cold in the winter, and they oscillate up and down and nothing much happens between 2003 and 2019. I mean, you get some variability with the El Nino cycle and so, but it's nothing drastic on 2011. Then we looked at the temperature of the off-platform waters, and in the summer, nothing much seems to be changing. The Florida current keeps its temperature constant over uh, uh, this period, 2003 to 2019, but something happens in the winter. In 2011, and onwards, the winter temperature of the Gulf Stream, the Florida current, gets about one degree warmer, it seems. And you can see that. So that increases the temperature disparity between the on and the off platform water body in the winter and provides an extra kinetic kick, we think, when you mix those waters to the aragonite saturation state and the mud factory then goes into overdrive. Also in 2011, we have a slowing of the Florida uh, current due to a longer term cycle uh, ongoing in the Atlantic and that actually serves to raise sea level quite substantially in the Bahamas by several centimeters uh, from 2011 onwards and of course as you raise sea level you can increase the mixing across the platform margin. So it seems that those two factors just a few centimeters rise in sea level and about a degree of warming of the winter temperatures of the Florida, Florida current can increase the amount of mud being produced from whitings on Great Bahama Bank by a factor of three. So that really emphasizes how subtle the controls are of this mud factory and how easily it, it, it is to, to amplify or de-amplify the amount of mud produced. And, and that of course has huge ramifications if you think about these processes in the rock record. Okay, so that seems to be what happened in 2011 at least. In terms of the seasonality of the whitings, uh, it doesn't seem that, uh, or sorry, the size of the whitings, their size doesn't really change uh, through time and they have a typical size of around 13 square kilometers or so, uh, regardless of season, maybe a little bit larger in the winter than they are in the summer. Okay. So we're now starting to understand a lot about how this mud can be produced. And we now want to model about the long-term sort of sediment budget potential of the process is. So we need to know how deep the water column is. And uh, for the area where the whitings are active on Great Bahama Bank, the typical depth is around uh, four and a half to five meters. And this is, we produced this very nice digital terrain model uh, with Mitch Harris some years ago. So we know the typical thickness of the water where the mud is being produced. And we can start with a very simple static model 
um, of the sediment budget of the platform. And my PhD student, Cece Lopez Gamundi, she is looking at this uh, in more detail with all the other producers, actually sediment producers on the platform top. So we take a typical whiting on a typical day. He's 13 square kilometers in area. And we can work out, therefore, the volume of that whiting. Uh, it has about 5.998 times 10 to 7 cubic meters it's, it's covering, as we image it from satellites. We know the, the concentration of the aragonite within the whiting from work from Jean Shin and others. And then we can work out that the, that whiting contains about 635 tons uh, of aragonite. Um, I mean, that's, that's actually quite a lot if you think about it. We can then take the specific gravity of wet aragonite muds from Newman on land and compute. We have about 550 cubic meters of lime mud in that single whiting's event, which if you lay it down on the seafloor over 13 square kilometers underneath that whiting would give a layer of a point of 0 0.04 millimeters in thickness uh, for that day. And, you know, of course, this is a little bit of a thumb suck. We might be overestimating the amount of mud because we're not allowing for dissolution of the mud on the sea floor or in the pore water. We're not transporting it. But by the same process, we're likely underestimating it because this is a static model and not a dynamic model, as I'll talk about in a bit. And we were not the first group to think about creating a sediment budget. So, for instance, Lisa Robbins and, and colleagues in their geology paper in 1997, they imaged the whitings from uh, astronaut photographs, actually. And then they calculated a daily area of the whitings. Uh, they scaled that to yearly. And then they scaled that up to 6,000 years because they made, the, I think, a very reasonable assumption that the whitings mud factory can't switch on until the Holocene transgression is delivered at least a few meters of water depth on the Great Bahama Bank. So they took 6,000 years as the age of the mud factory and then looked at the mud volumes. So we attempted now to reproduce such a model looking over uh, the uh, uh, Holocene timeframes, but using our refined estimates of the behavior of the mud factory in terms of its frequency, its area, the drift of the, the, the sediments, the lifetime of the whitings of water depth and so on and so forth. And so we go through those maturations and we count the whitings with a neural network in our climatology and we scale it to 6,000 years. And we can see that you can produce a mud drape in 6,000 years of about a half a meter to 0.6 of a meter thick, considering the size of the whiting area is about 10,000 square kilometers and we know how uh, the mud is distributed in this area from samples uh, collected by John Reimer and Peter Swartz uh, uh, some years ago back in 2009 so we understand the size of the platform top mud drape quite well so is this realistic well if you look at work also coming out of John Reimer's group and this is uh, Renko Wedge and colleagues Gregor and Peter Swartz also involved who had chirp sub-bottom lines across Great Bahama Bank, you see that the mud wedge is probably a little bit thicker actually than half a meter. It's more likely two meters thick or something like that, uh, give or take in the limited data that we have available. So it seems that our model is underestimating uh, the amount of platform top mud, but you know that's irregardless of the huge mud wedge that you have on the western side of um, Great Bahama Bank, which according to Wilbur, uh, is about 200 kilometers long, seven kilometers wide and up to 15 meters thick, this peri platform mud, mud wedge. And our, of course our model is just not producing enough mud to account for what's on the platform top, let alone this huge wedge of mud, which has been lost from the platform top and is accumulating on its flanks. This is uh, Andrew Joe, uh, also part of Rasmus. He was a student at Rasmus who processed multi-beam also to further constrain this. So why is our model underperforming? Well, it's because it's a static model, which makes no sense. I mean, it's sort of predetermined to underperform because what we're saying is that the satellite passes over Great Bahama Bank, it images a whiting, you sort of have an instantaneous production of sediment, which settles down to the seafloor, 
And then when the satellite comes over again and images the whiting a, a, a second time, you have another puff of sediment and then so on and so forth with, with each satellite overpart, which is of course total nonsense. What we're seeing from the satellite when we see a whiting here is a mixture of mud which has been produced at that time, some which was produced at an earlier time and some was uh, mud which was produced even earlier than that. So the whiting is constant and it's dynamic and it's producing mud through time and we know that because it doesn't settle to the seafloor in six hours. We can see the same whiting day after day after day. So it has this dynamic rejuvenation factor. Uh, again, underlining the case that the whiting is an active living uh, precipitating factory while it's active and it's not static in any way. So if the mud would settle in six hours, but we can image the same whiting 24 hours later, that rejuvenation factor must be at least a factor of four. And if you take that into account, you can, produ you can produce enough mud in this model to account for 60% of all of the mud which is produced in the Holocene in the platform top and out on the peri-platform mud wedge on the flanks of the uh, platform, which starts to get us into the ballpark because of course all of the mud on Great Bahama Bank and all uh, on its flanks are not whitings in origin. There's some skeletal component and so on and so forth. Probably though, considering that the whitings last for up to sort of nine days to two weeks, that rejuvenation factor of four, even that is an underestimate and you only have to increase it to a factor of seven and you can account for 100% of the mud on the platform top and uh, off platform which have been deposited in the Holocene. So to recap, you have a mud factory, it's only in 1% of the platform, it's absolutely tiny in size, but plausibly you can produce all of the mud uh, uh, on the platform top and that is which has been lost off the platform to the flanks in the Holocene from this tiny factory. So that's why whitings are important. So to recap on the key findings, I've shown that mixing gradients on Great Bahama Bank uh, uh, of, uh, with um, temperature gradients of a degree Celsius or more are very fertile ground for switching on the mud factory. Once you produce a whiting, it has an area of around 13 square kilometers. It persists for a, for a week to two weeks and it drifts quite a distance and produces in excess of 5,500 metric tons of lime mud. There's a seasonality to the factory though. It's much more productive in winter than it is in summer. And we think that is because of the difference uh, in temperature is the kinetic trigger the whiting needs. And that's uh, more um, uh, pronounced in the winter. And also something happens in 2011 where we increase that deficit in temperature even further due to the warming of the Florida current in the winter by about a degree and also a slight rise in sea level due to the slowing of that current. And that subtle environmental forcing is enough to double or even triple the amount of mud produced on Great Bahama Bank. Um, so you could imagine if you raise sea level even further or change temperature even uh, more dramatically what you could do to such a factory in the rock record. And our lime mud budget model suggests that whitings can and account for at least 60% of the Holocene bank top and peri platform mud uh, that's accumulated on the west side of Great Bahama Bank, but more plausibly 100% of that volume. Appropriately sized subtropical platforms are predisposed to copious mud production through whitings. And by analogy, we think that they're likely significant on ancient platforms also. So I'll finish with a final slide here, which shows whitings forming in the Bahamas and they're of grand sedimentological consequence now as they were, I think, in the geological past. So thanks very much for your time and I will certainly take any questions if you have them. Super, thanks so much for the wonderful talk, Sam. Um, I was surely jotting down notes nearly the whole time. <laughs> Usually I have a couple of minutes to slip some of my own questions in there, but I think this um, was stimulating a lot, of, um, a lot of people's thought processes. So we already have a few in the chat, so I'm just gonna get started with those first. 
Our first question is from Axel joining us from Erlangen in Germany. Hi, Axel. He says, great talk. Do you think that it worked the same or similar um, during times of calcite seas? Well, that's uh, okay. That, that's a very good um, question. And um, I don't know the answer to it. I'm going to be honest. You'd have to look at the kinetics of precipitating calcite directly from the water column. But I would, I, I, I would venture it's certainly possible that, that, um, that uh, the effect would have been the same. And so, yes, but I can't speak, um, I can't speak fluently to the geochemistry and we'd have to look at that. But that's certainly the way that we see this project going is to understand it in the modern. And then once we have the, the chemical models where we can reproduce the observations that we see, for example, in the Bahamas, to then start to play with the chemistry to mimic what was going on in deeper time and try to understand how you get these, these thick non-skeletal carbonate deposits um you, you know being produced so i i I've, i regret to actually i can't go further than that but it, it's certainly um something worthy of study agreed all right so our next question is from stephen um, joining us from wales he says thanks sam for a terrific presentation considering the increase seen from 2011 have you attempted to predict future carbonate mud production under the different ipcc climate and sea level scenarios well, okay, so th that's um, that's also a good question. And yes, we have been thinking in that direction, but you have two sort of opposing levers at play when you think about um, think about you, you know anthropogenically forced climate change. Is that you you you're, you're we're certainly raising sea level and increasing temperatures, so that's a force for increasing mud production. But you're also changing ocean chemistry. You're making the seawater well, we call it ocean acidification, which is a bit of a misnomer because the sea's not exactly becoming acidic, it's becoming less alkali. But that would be a force to, uh, you would think, to um, prevent, um, you know, uh, the precipitation. So um, it, it, that's a complex question, uh, but it's cer certainly something we're, we're tracking and uh, we will be looking into, but it's which of those two forcings holds, holds sway. Is it the, the, the increase in sea level and temperature promoting mud production, or is it the changes, you know, anthropogenically forced changes to uh, water chemistry, which is going to be impeding mud production? So um, it, it's a good question, but very relevant, actually, if you think about, and I, I have a student working on this, about uh, how low-lying uh, islands like Andros will persist under the case of rising sea level, because, of course, the mud produced on the platform top um, nourishes the mud flats, which um, you know, which make up the majority of Andros Island. And if you switch off the mud factory, you know, rising sea level is going to be a big problem for such a low lying area. Um, and so it's a it's a very relevant question to think about the future hab habitability of islands like Andros. And as I say, I have a student who's working on that, looking at aerial photographs through time to see exactly how the coastline is responding uh, to changes in sea level of the last 50 years or so. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, okay, our next question is from Valentin, joining from Oslo. Um, <laughs> he has a caveat. So he's a classic sedimentologist. Sorry if the question is sort of obvious for experts, but he wants to know how could we in the rock record differentiate between mud made by whitings um, versus other types of calcareous mud? Well, it's the isotopic signature. So, so whitings, uh, whitings have a geochemical signature which which separates it uh, um, separates it from uh, sources uh, uh, other sources of mud, such as the breakdown of skeletal organisms. And so, um, and I'm I'm not going to talk in um, detail on what that isotopic signature is because it's certainly not my level uh, my expertise. It's my colleague. Amanda's and Peter Swart and so. Uh, Chelsea, of course, your, your expertise as well. But there's, there's isotopic uh, tools that we can use to make that distinction. Um, okay, our next question is from Maurice Tucker. He wants to know, or he says, wonderful talk. He wants to know if the precipitates are all um, aragonite needles or nanoscale particles. Um, and then- okay. Okay, I'll let you go get on that one and then I'll uh, ask the second half of the question. Okay, so, so um, um, to my understanding, Morris, uh, mostly aragonitic needles, but this is, uh, this is something which deserves further sampling 
and is it, it, it's something we're looking to do uh, actually is to sample more completely Whiting's inaction to, to start to get at those um, those questions. The problem is is when the winter, when the Whitings are at their most active, is the toughest time to be working um, to be working out there. But we, we've got a strategy for how to collect uh, um, that. So uh, needles. But I know there's a second part to the question. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting to track it over the lifetime of um, exactly of that exact Whiting to see how the precipitates actually change or possibly not. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, second half of the question, why does the whiting um, finish? So what causes it to terminate? Water well mixed and no temperature contrast? Well, yeah, we don't understand that yet, but are working on diffusive models to try to explain it. I mean, one thing which is surprising is that the drifter whitings, once they've come away um, from that mixing front, um, they can spend, they can persist for days, you know, well, weeks away from the mixing front. So it seems that the mixing front is key for producing the whiting, but it can subsist without that uh, kinetic boost for a reasonable length of time. So surely, yes, it is, um, uh, it's the decay of the, uh, of the kinetic trigger, but it, the, uh, let me take the question the other way around. It could be that the whiting can persist uh, without the kinetic trigger for a, 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 a meaningful number of days because you're producing a lot of nucleation material in the whiting itself, which serves to to um, to nurture or promote that reaction. And it, it could it could be limited by the nucleation material not being present in the water column in other circumstances, but. Yes, I mean, I think we're thinking on the same lines as you, but we don't completely understand, understand yet, you know, what signals the death of the whiting. Okay, um, our next question is from Fiona Whitaker. She wants, uh, well, she says, loved your talk. Thanks, Sam. Especially well received in dark, cold winter UK. Um, have you calculated? Well, you, that was the audience I, I, I was, you know, <laughs> aiming for. <laughs> Always sunny and wide in the Bahamas. Yeah. Um, okay, so she wants to know if you've calculated mass of aragonite that could precipitate from a given water mass, um, which would be the next step from aragonite saturation index. Uh, well, we, we're working on it. Oh, we're, we're working, and, and, and my colleague Amanda Ayla, I mean, she's really leading the charge on this, and um, and I, I I think the initial chemical model that um, I, I spoke about very briefly in the talk was, was perhaps a little bit pedestrian and where we, uh, well, we, the royal we, Amanda and her team are, uh, you know, uh, are getting close. So I can't speak to that yet, but um, I hope to soon. Okay, um, our next question is from Robert Arnott. Um, really enjoyed your talk. If principally driven by a thermal gradient condition and hydrodynamics to mix, are these conditions unique to the Bahamas and the one other place that you mentioned where whitings are forming today? Wouldn't a similar uh, thermal regime be common elsewhere? Okay, well, so that, that's a really great question. And I'm gonna answer it and say, it's all to do with being in the horse latitudes. Uh, the two places where whitings are formed are, they're not in the tropics. The Bahamas is north of the Tropic of Cancer and the other place where we, we see meaningful amount of whitings is in the Persian Arabian Gulf. And you don't get whitings in the tropics and the isolated platforms, carbonate platforms, which form in the tropics are very different because you don't get whitings, you do get reefs. And so in the tropics, an isolated carbonate platform is typically reef rimmed with a deep lagoon. If you go to the north or, or indeed the south, of the tropics into what we call the horse latitudes. So north of the tro to Tropic of Cancer and south of the Tropic of Capricorn, you don't get reefs to such a degree because it's too cold in the winter. That's, that's the problem. But you switch on the mud factory from the whitings because it's too cold in the winter and you mix the platform top waters, they get chilled at that latitude in the winter, in the shallows, to these very cold temperatures, but still the off-platform waters are relatively warm because they're connected to circulation patterns which originate in the tropics, such as the Gulf Stream, the Florida Current, and so on and so forth. So that's the reason I think why this 
this motif of mud production is not in the tropics, but is pervasive in the horse latitudes. And actually it has a lot to st say about the style of carbonate platform you get uh, in, in those two different climate regimes. I, I think well, I, uh, I, I stayed on script with your question, um, but that's why. So the two, the two areas where the mud factories are turn, turned on are uh, at higher latitude than the tropics. And it's the winters which are key, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, from my understanding, it might also be possible that there are areas that we just haven't recognized these whitings before. Is that an option within these horse latitude? Well, um, I that, that might be true, um, but I mean, we, we've been uh, sort of hunting whitings okay. uh, diligently, uh, even in the Bahamas they only form on the really large platforms. And that I could give a whole presentation on that, uh, which is also due to the fact that it's only if the platform's big enough to, do the waters get cold enough, mm -hmm. uh, because otherwise the mixing is, is too efficient. So um, I, I, I mean, certainly if people have seen whitings elsewhere, I'd be interested to hear about them. We get them in Florida Bay and on the west coast of Florida, but again, uh, we're in the horse latitudes. I would challenge anyone to find a, a whiting in the tropics, but uh, I mean, uh, you know, if, if you do, uh, you know, I'm totally amenable to adapting my hypothesis, but we're not aware of any tropical cases. Sure. Okay, our next question comes from Christine Zong from down the hall in um, University of Bochum. And um, Christine wants to know, in addition to the current observations, are there any sedimentary structures which are preserved in the Bahama platform sediments that can indicate the direction of currents? Um, well, I mean, off platform, yes. I mean, you have contour rides and strong currents in, in the Straits of Florida, which lead to the formation of dune systems, which indeed migrate up slope. So in the deep, yes. On the platform top, the currents are really too lethargic to form um, meaningful bed forms, unless you get to the high energy areas where the UIDs have been produced or so, and you have, you know, uh, I mean, huge sand waves of oolitic grainstone, but that's a totally different part of the platform. So in, in, the, um, in the Whitings area, no, no, we're not getting bed forms um, from the currents, but perhaps the lack of bed forms is and, as indicative of the environment as their presence. And, um, uh, you know, this is a fairly quiescent environment uh, in that central part of the platform, but the hydrodynamic models and indeed the drifting of the Whitings, you know, they're, they're sort of God's own drifter experiment shows that, it, you know, it, it's not totally quiescent and you do get you know, meaningful current movement, but are not, not enough to, to give bed forms. And indeed, if the current was too strong, um, as it might be in other parts of the platform, uh, even if you were producing whitings, they would be lost off the platform too quickly and diffused. And, and you know, that might be another reason why the factory is confined to just 1% of the platform and the, the other 99%, the levers just aren't quite right, it seems, to switch the factory on. Mm -hmm. Here, our next question is from John Reimer, um, joining us from Duran. Hi, John. Thanks, Sam. Great talk. Now, I do understand um, why the Perry Platform Wedge on the Western Great Bahama Bank shows such distinct climate-related cyclicity. We can discuss by email. Why do crystals vary in size, needle, and needle clusters? Well, uh, I mean, John, uh, good to hear from you and happy to discuss by email, but yes, um, I think, uh, you know, I, I think if, if I believe my own data set, it would seem that the factory is incredibly sensitive, incredibly sensitive to changes in uh, its environmental and, and biophysical forcing. So, I mean, just to recap, um, a one degree change in the winter temperature of the Florida current and a, just a few centimeters of sea level rise amplifies the productivity by a factor of three of the mud factory. And yeah, as you observe, it, that may manifest in crystal size uh, and, you know, and, and other properties of the mud itself. So um, yeah, super good observation and, and enthusiastic to discuss it with you. Okay, our next question is from Tracy in Nebraska. Tracy, um, she says, really enjoyed the talk. Wondering whether it's possible to detect density or um, opacity differences in whitings from satellite data, which might give insight into relative rates of mud production. Yes, yes it is. Well, okay, so my, uh, other PhD student I, I uh, mentioned in the talk, C.C. Lopez-Gamundi, is working on exactly that. So 
you know, we were using the satellite in a, rare, a fairly blunt way just to recognize whitings. But of course, these uh, hyperspectral or nearly hyperspectral satellites are very capable at diagnosing suspended sediment matter. And uh, they are very, the algorithms to do that in the open ocean are very mature and we use them routinely. Um, the algorithms to do that where you can see the seafloor uh, is a little bit more complex because you have to optically uh, disentangle the, the, the reflectance from the water column itself, which is the signal we'd be after in this case, versus the signal from the seafloor, which is noise in this application. But um, we're working on that and, and we hope soon to be able to diagnose, you know, sort of like uh, milligrams per cubic meter of aragonite uh, mm -hmm. from the satellite itself. And, um, and then that will give us a much greater understanding of what a whiting is. Because when we, we image the whiting from satellite, it has a sort of crisp boundary and we say that's the whiting. But uh, it's logical and it's also been seen if, if you sail a ship through a whiting taking samples of geochemical proxies, the whiting is actually quite a lot larger than what you can see. It's just the aragonite is at such low density, it doesn't have an optical signature to the naked eye at least, but we, we hope to process the satellite data in a much more um, clever way and get at exactly what you're saying. And I think we're pretty much there, but CC is following up on that. And I, you know, I'm sure she'll be giving a presentation soon uh, here or there on that topic. Perfect. Our next question is from Vincent joining us from China. And he wants to know what the data is for the modeling that you've done. Um, what does the data include? The, the, uh, the um, hydrodynamic modeling or the, well, let me start with that. So the hydrodynamic model is forced by uh, wind speed and um, tidal height, you know, which we can monitor directly. And from a broader scale ocean uh, models like HICOM or so, those, th those play into the, the, this model that we call SLIM. And then we actually validate the hydrodynamic model by, by um, the model gives the tidal height at any point within the model domain. And we can validate that that's right using satellite altimeter overpasses to check that the model is competent. And the second way we calibrate the hydrodynamic model is actually using the whitings themselves, which are drifting around. Like I say, they're God's own drifter experiment. And so we can check that the drift of the whitings, uh, which is real data, if you will, actually corroborates the hydrodynamic model. The chemical model, and I'll, and I'll just skim the top of this because this is really Amanda's expertise, uses the temperature, of course, like I've explained, but also the other constituents of the seawater, uh, the salinity, uh, the, 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 the existing satura saturation state before you start mixing the water bodies and so on and so forth. So the geochemical model is increasing in complexity, but I'm not going to um, uh, pretend that I can give it uh, justice. And so I will uh, stop with that on the geochemical part. Sure. Um, okay, so our next question comes again from Fiona and she wants to know if you think that there's a correlation or sorry, if there's a concentration threshold that you need to exceed to make the whitings visible from satellite, might there be slower production in areas that remain invisible with satellite? Yeah, imagery? yeah I mean, we absolutely, uh, and I think that's why I acknowledged answering a previous question that even uh, in the whiting that you can see from satellite, we're underestimating it the size because with the naked eye, at least, we can't see that sort of gradual degradation below concentrations, which give an optical signature. And I think this is something that we can get at once we have this shallow water optical model refined from the MODIS satellite, which ca is capable of detecting concentrations of sediment you know, using ratios of wavelengths of light, which we can't visualize. Um, and so I think we can map those to a degree using uh, a, a, a more clever application of the satellite. But still, yes, there, are, there, there is going to be ongoing precipitation, of course, uh, within the water column, which we can't even see using that methodology. And that's something you really can only get at by more, a more extensive sampling of the water column across the Bahamas platforms which is something that we you know, are dying to do and submit proposals to get the necessary ship time, um, but so far you know, haven't uh, managed to do that. However, we have a trick and for some long and um, 
uh, otherwise unexplainable reason, Rasmus, the institute I work at, has a helicopter. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we, we're now starting to develop an idea that we could actually sample from the helicopter by lowering Niskin bottles, bottles down and collect samples without disturbing the water surface within whitings, within their boundaries, and sort of outside whitings. And then we can start to get at that, um, that, that question that you're looking at. And it turns out actually the helicopter is considerably cheaper than the ship when all things are considered. Yeah, what does the helicopter run you per day? Average? I think that, well, the, helico the, the helicopter is several um, thousand, a uh, thousand dollars an hour or something like that. But you, you know, you can be very efficient. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, okay, so we had a, another comment from um, John indicating another widening area, which is in Belize. So if you're interested, then check out the paper that he has um, posted in the chat. So uh, is, is that John Reimer, John? John Reimer, yep. John, I will be I will be straight onto the chat to check that out. Yes. <laughs> yes, um, uh, Gieschler et al, 2013. Yes. Okay. But also, you're, you're in a position where you get winter cold front. So I, I, I think you, you still have the kinetic driver that you would in the Bahamas in Belize. Definitely. Yeah. So one of my, um, now that I think for now, we don't have any more comments from the chat. If anybody has any last comments, please send them through. Um, in the meantime, I will ask one of my questions, um, not to keep you here for another 30 minutes or so. But um, yeah, I'm curious about the corresponding influence of any biological cycling, metabolisms, there's been a lot of talk of dust influx um, influencing the whiting. So I'm curious if some of those aspects might also help um, promote the whitings occurring. Yeah, totally, totally. And, and we, we think that biology is really important. Uh, and um, certain cyanobacteria have been implicated in, in the you know, the nuance of the kinetic trigger in the past, and they are probably key for further altering the aragonite saturation state, you know, down on the sort of like submillimeter to micron scale. However, uh, I think the fact that the factory is only operating in 1% of Great Bahama Bank um, suggests that the biology isn't the sole trigger, because could you imagine that the biology is restricted to that tiny area of the platform and not elsewhere? Probably not. I mean, you'd think the biology would be evenly distributed through the water column. So I think the biology is absolutely critical, but it has to be complemented by, you know, the, the correct hydrodynamics and maybe this and the temperature differential we've spoken about and surely other factors as well that we don't yet understand. And all of those when they're set in exactly the right way, conspire to turn on the mud factory. And, you know, I just emphasize it again, the mud factory is tiny, you know, but very productive. Once you switch on the mud factory, you can produce vast, vast quantities of mud, albeit in a small area, but because it's, you know, fine grained aragonitic lime mud, you, you can distribute it over a much larger area, even if the, the factory itself is quite small. So yes, the biology is absolutely important, but it's not exclusively the answer. Sure. Um, so one other question or, or thought process that I had about how these whitings actually begin or start to terminate. So it looked on some of your maps that they generally move from west to east. And so I'm wondering, I don't know if that's correct, but if they do, then are you just removing that temperature difference? So as you move further, onto the platform, it's getting too warm, and then that mixing of the cold water isn't, isn't there? Yeah, I think, I think that's true. I mean, the, the, as I called it, the warehouse is, you know, sort of a little bit more inboard mm -hmm. uh, towards Andros. So uh, you, you're starting to lose the temperature differential, but you're also probably starting to exhaust the water mass uh, in terms of, of its chemical, um, how chemically conducive it is for, to, to ha have the precipitation undergoing mm -hmm. as the residence time of the water mass becomes longer. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, uh, it distance away from the margin, you know, it, it seems to be, it seems to be part of the death of the whiting for sure, yes. So maybe a loss of the mixing of the cold and warmer waters and then also um, the saturation state of the, yeah. those fluids locally is being reduced to a yes. where it can't, okay. Yes. Great. Um, okay, so we have one more question from Philip. 
Um, and he wants to know how opaque the whitings are. Um, yeah, from the perspective of so photosynthetic bacteria, does the relationship oh, so between photosynthesis and whitings have a self-regulating effect? Oh, so you mean the shading of the whiting would sort of would curtail the photosynthesis? I mean, that is a super question from Philip. Um, and actually, you know, I'm just thinking back to work I, I did years ago with my sort of PhD. You know, there are optical models where you could actually look at that. The thing is, the aragonite mud is a very effective reflector of light across the wavelengths. Um, that's why they appear bright or white in the satellite imagery. And with that, you might in fact increase the photosynthetic, um, you know, the, the, the PAR, the, photo, the, the available photosynthetic uh, irradiance by the, 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 the a very effective scattering of the photons within the, within the whiting. And uh, so it, 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 rather than a shading, um, it might even be a positive feedback. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So still a lot to, to learn and I'm excited to see what you guys do in the future. Um, thank you, Sam, again for joining us for this SEDS Online webinar. We really appreciate it. And to everybody out there watching, we will be back next week where Clara Bletler from the University of Chicago will be talking to us about ocean chemistry. See you then. Thank you very much uh, and uh, see you all soon.